So first of all, thank you, Caesar, for um, giving us that intro and welcoming everybody to the summit today. Um, we're so glad you were able to join us again, as you've done in the past, and um, being able to give such a warm welcome. So thank you so much for that. And next up, we're going to be moving into our federal representatives panel, um, improving mobility for all. And I need to give a very special shout out to Sherry, um, who approached us about 18 months ago and said, hey, I have this great idea for a panel. What if we put together um, information about federal programs that um, help with improving mobility for all, but maybe weren't traditionally thought of right away as part of that mix. So I'll talk a little bit about you, Sherry, and I know you're gonna be um, introducing the other folks, but Sherry's had 32 years of public service spanning tribal, state, and federal governments and nonprofit. She has held leadership positions in the FHWA Office of Planning, Environment, and Realty for 14 years. She's currently the Director of the Office of Human Environment. She supervises three teams with responsibilities for financial oversight of the office research program, advancing multimodal connectivity by addressing bicycle and pedestrian networks, environmental justice, and economic development. Accelerating project delivery through application of context sensitive design principles, implementing the transportation alternatives program and administering procedures and standards for modifying the national highway system and the strategic highway network. Sherry. Thank you, I appreciate it, uh, Lisa. Um, yeah, as, as was said, this panel is a long time in making, so we uh, definitely appreciate the panel uh, waiting for a year, uh, and, and now we've got a great opportunity here. We thought it would re be really wonderful for the UTCs to hear the activities of the panel and provide an opportunity for some great interaction today. Um, this group of federal agencies and the folks on this panel are amplifying, partnering, or closely coordinating efforts with Federal Highway and USDOT and they will uh, each tell you their stories. Uh, from Federal Highway's perspective, we really appreciate the opportunity to shape calls for research, serve on review panels, and participate in the various research advisory meetings on the topics that closely align with our research agenda. First, let me share a few highlights uh, of what my and other FHW offices are doing. This should help facilitate today's e-networking e and all the breakouts. Uh, and we have FHWA and DOT staff participating throughout the day to elaborate on these activities and participate in the breakout sessions. Um, we've also put a one-page handout of web links uh, that will be put in the chat pod or Lisa, I think, shared with you to share with the participants because uh, we're not gonna have any time to go through all that. We want to get onto our presenters. I am gonna highlight a few things uh, that are in those uh, web links. Uh, first of all, we are supporting uh, all users in making complete trips. In January of this year, we awarded over $38 million to five awardees for our ITS for Us program uh, to address uh, large-scale replicable deployments that generate increased mobility options across all the modes uh, to address the challenges of planning and executing complete trips for persons with disabilities. We're just finishing up our curbside research report, which is a partnership between ourselves and the Institute for Transportation Engineers. Uh, we are a lead convener on uh, micromobility within the agency and have put together fact sheets. Um, last summer, we worked with nine federal agencies to share all, all of our perspectives on uh, micromobility as an emerging uh, transportation mode. And these were um, uh, shared at the US uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission Micromobility Summit in September last year. Um, FTA chairs our department's mobility innovation work group uh, that includes members of all modes in the office of the secretary. And uh, they have helped us compile links in that one page handout. There's a substantial amount of work going on with mobility on demand. Uh, uh, FTA is, uh, in, uh, uh, has done quite a work with the mobility on demand sandbox and they've got a recent addition to that effort is the Multimodal Measures Report, which presents mobility performance strategy and describes how to develop metrics. Um, DOT is also providing research to improve mobility for 
of people with disabilities with the Accessible Transportation Technologies Policy Impact Assessment White Paper, uh, the FHWA Freight Mobility Trends Analysis Tools, an interactive dashboard that presents national freight statistics. Um, we've got an emerging automated urban freight delivery concept, state of the practice scan, an example of our efforts to monitor how new technologies integrate or don't into the surface transportation system. And you'll also note uh, the work going on to promote inclusive design of automated vehicles. Uh, today, uh, later, as was said, Robert Hampshire will be giving you the administration direction that's flowing from all the executive orders and the president's infrastructure proposal. Um, know that work groups are already well underway in influencing our research agenda on equity mapping, complete streets, and a bundle of work around climate change, carbon reduction via electrification, uh, and resiliency. Uh, we are continuing our work with uh, DOE's National Renewable Energy Lab to designate and support alternative fuel corridors. We're working to establish a network of EV charging and alternative fueling infrastructure along the highway corridors. Uh, our vulnerable user safety and build out of complete and connected multimodal networks are being framed around the Complete Streets Initiative, where we're wrapping in all the work from the recent USDOT Pedestrian Safety Action Plan on our, and our own evaluation of our uh, five-year strategic agenda for pet and bike transportation. Um, given all the executive orders promote a whole of government approach, know that partnership, partnership efforts are expanding with our EPA colleagues at the Office of uh, Community Revitalization. They're providing technical assistance on emerging mobility. Uh, HUD and EPA uh, and our uh, uh, DOT are organizing a tri-agency equity training together in a couple weeks. And CDC's uh, contacting us wanting to coordinate uh, for example, they're preparing an updated complete streets map that shows U.S. population covered by complete streets policy. So with that warm up, uh, let's get to our presenters. We're going to start with uh, David Corman. He's the program director at the National Science Foundation, uh, Cyber Physical Systems, uh, future, future of Work at the Human Technology Frontier and his core research. Uh, and is in smart and connected communities. So uh, David, if you'll start and then we'll uh, move on to the next folks and I'll introduce them when you finish. Hey David, you can start sharing your screen. Yep. Okay. Uh, I think I'm on presenter view or slide. You're, I think you should be able to see the full screen. So uh, I'm. thank you, Sherry, for the introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. I remember the invitation last year about this time and uh, you know, regretfully it was canceled. Uh, my subject is gonna be mobility for all, research at the National Science Foundation. And what I'm gonna do is Tell you, give you a little preview into a number of the activities that we do supporting transition, transportation and mobility research. Sherry mentioned uh, several of these programs and I kind of want to uh, amplify them a bit. So uh, we have a pro ongoing program called Smart and Connected Communities. And it turns out that uh, it's a, program that's very much related to mobility for all. It focuses on transportation systems. It looks for what we refer to as strong integrative research, integrative research in that it looks at both the technology and the social dimensions. The horizon is roughly five to 10 years, and it includes a number of really interesting projects that uh, relate to some of the themes that, uh, that Sherry uh, mentioned, including things like uh, micromobility. There's a project that we have with Rutgers dealing with integrating micromobility safely into some communities in New Jersey. It also includes projects on uh, mobility for blind and visually impaired navigating within the cities such as New York. 
one of the pro one of the programs that we're really excited about, and I'll go into that in a bit more detail later, something called Civic Innovation Challenge. It's a research in action competition. And one of the tracks in it is framed with mobility options to help solve the spatial mismatch between jobs and housing. Uh, glad to mention that uh, this is a program that includes, especially in this track, great partnership with Department of Energy Vehicle Technology Office. Involves uh, Mark Smith and one of our panelists here. Uh, finally, kind of the granddaddy of the programs that really spun off Smart Connected Community Civic Innovation Challenge, our Cyber Physical Systems Program, which is really core science and core research and system science for complex systems. It includes things like looking at individual vehicles, control of uh, an entire transit system, transportation system, autonomy, research in transit and freight, typically a five to 10, 15 year research horizon. One thing I'd also want to mention is we have funded several rapids, rapids in response to the pandemic and especially in the area of how does one work with transit systems as they are impacted by COVID. What kind of changes do those have to face? Uh, Smart and Connected Community Program. On the right side, you see a uh, set of pin drops at the locations that the program has supported. So 42 states plus District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. I mentioned it's use-inspired research, technology, social dimensions, we, also, we look at these projects, you have to pilot activities within the community. These just aren't simply, let's do some great technology research, but these are bringing the community in through community engagement and demonstrating capabilities at mid and at the end of the grant. Uh, we look at scalability and transferability as one moves from community to community and just an uh, important aspect is that approximately 25% of those projects, 25% of the awards really fit in the space of transportation and mobility. Yeah. Okay, I want to talk briefly Civic Innovation Challenge. Usually when we talk NSF projects, we talk about the research community driving the project. And that's the way it is generally in cyber physical systems, smart connected community. Research gets pushed from the researcher side, the academic side into the community. In the Civic Innovation Challenge, what we really look to do is flip that, that dynamic. And Instead of pushing the research, the community becomes a partner in shaping the research. We have two tracks, uh, communities and mobility. I mentioned before, better mobility options to solve spatial mismatch between housing affordability and jobs. Track B, resilience to natural disasters. Department of Energy is our great partner, especially focused on track A. And we have Department of Homeland Security supporting the Track B Resilience to Natural Disaster. So it's a research in action competition. We are at the stage right now finishing up a planning grant boot camp. That boot camp phase has lasted roughly four months. I mentioned it flips the dynamic. Partner communities are really helping to drive this. And we look for in the next stage, so it's a two-stage two competition, 52 awards made, 21 of those for planning grants in communities and mobilities. Second stage proposals get turned in May 5th, and those would be for 
million dollar teams competing for million dollar grants to have an impact demonstrated in the one year type, one year time horizon. CPS program, many of you are very familiar with it already. Uh, it's a program that is in fact had significant uh, collaboration with Department of Transportation Federal Highway Agency over the past, uh, past really eight years. Core science, complex engineering, complex systems. It looks for cross-cutting research in this core area with applications around the, uh, around the core. It's a thriving community. Over the past 10 years, roughly $400 million of research investment. And they're currently on the order of 300, uh, 300 active grants. Annual PI meeting is almost like a mini, mini conference, 500 attendees, and it's multi-agency. DOT, as I mentioned, NIFA, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, PHS and NIH. And those are really some highlights of activities that we do, and we'd be happy to talk about those during the panel. Thank you, David. Uh, Prasad Gupta uh, is the technology manager uh, from the Department of Energy Vehicle Technologies Office and the Energy Efficient Mobility Systems Program. And Prasad, if you could proceed with your presentation. Um, we, um, have our break at uh, a little, about 12.05, so we'll have to keep moving pretty quickly here. Yep, great, um, thank you. I'm just gonna see, share my screens here. All right. Um, oh, can you, can you hear me? Yes. And see my screen? Yes. All righty. So uh, thank you everybody um, for, um, um, my name is Prasad Gupta. I'm a technology manager in the Vehicle Technologies Office. It's a program within the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, uh, which is uh, an office uh, within the Department of Energy. Um, so just wanted to give you a very high level overview of our program. So the program I'm in in the Vehicle Technologies Office, um, we've his the, the, the historic focus of our office has been on, 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 on Kind of component level R and D, kind of on the on the lower left uh, uh, part of the screen, you know, where we're looking at developing next generation batteries, new materials technology, advanced propulsion systems, combustion systems, um, light weighting materials, um, and as you all know, uh, the transportation system and the vehicle systems world has 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 been upended, and we're starting to look at things. At a, at a transportation level. So I think of the EAMS program as kind of evolving from just kind of component level R&D all the way to sort of up, up the chain uh, as you go up to the upper right corner, um, where we're looking at single component to single vehicle, all the way up to sort of urban network level. So we're, we're, we're a systems R&D program within the vehicle technologies office. I think of ourselves as having one foot in the vehicles world and another foot in the transportation world. Um, and as you know, uh, the transportation uh, system is a system of systems. And what the research that we're funding within EAMS is really bounded by, I think, you know, again, enabled by connectivity and automation in the left and the right. And we're looking at everything in between, movement of goods, movement of passengers. You know, how do vehicle technologies, as vehicle technologies evolve, how are these impacting all these other things? How do travelers make decisions? How do we improve our shared mobility? What impact does that have on transit and of, on land use? So we're, we're, we're un, trying to understand the system of systems be, be, beyond just, uh, just the vehicle level, but, but really how the vehicle um, is going to impact all these other parameters. Um, so the way our office is structured, we, we really have four big boxes. Um, we have a national lab consortium uh, that, that's really focused on modeling these systems. Uh, we have an HPC and artificial intelligence uh, program uh, that, that's taking advantage of the, of the high performance computing capability within the Department of Energy and 
you know, taking that capability and applying it to uh, not just the vehicle level, but again, the transportation level. Um, then we have some, you know, some, some, we call it the simulation evaluation part of our program. That's core tools, uh, some, some, some core tool capabilities at the national labs that really enable a lot of the modeling and simulation that we're doing. That, that's really more of our hardware uh, part of the program. And then finally, um, we, we call it the Connected and Automated Technology Development Program. This is where we have solicitations to build off of all of these capabilities. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, that um, in, in, in subsequent slides. So again, you know, one of, one of the things that we've been doing um, in the EAMS program is developing this integrated modeling capability, um, really integrating, um, you know, uh, simulate, uh, really integrating um, uh, model, models from, from all kinds of different levels of fidelity, all the way from, you know, kind of microscopic traffic control, but really all the way to, to urban network uh, modeling. And it's really in incorporating, you know, all kinds of other models like land use models, EV charging models, um, vehicle market markets. How will how will um, the the vehicle adoption change over time um, as new technologies come into play? And then we're able to you know simulate um, very very high fidelity vehicle control of of those of of, of those systems um, and and really understand. How it, how it will interact um, you know, in the future uh, under a lot of different scenarios. Um, so it's taken a lot of time to develop this capability. And um, you know, one of the things that, that if you haven't seen it already, we uh, started to publish this material. Um, we've broken, broken them down into six major uh, areas. And you can go to this website and, and download um, these reports. Each, each of these reports are, are are well, well over 100 pages, so there's a significant amount of detail that really kind of explains, you know, the breadth and depth of, of, of the work that we've been doing. Moving forward, uh, we wanted to build off of that capability, um, you know, build off of that workflow that I just sort of mentioned um, in the previous slide, um, and, and really add on additional capabilities. So again, add on functionality on connected and, and automated vehicles. Um, be able to bring that capability, that modeling and simulation out into the lab and do some field testing. But in addition, we want to look at all these other things on the right hand side uh, by, you know, in including some, again, some new capabilities on curb management, on, on uh, further, capa further capabilities on freight, further capabilities in defining the metrics of, of, of the impacts of all of these technologies. We've been looking at uh, even some things on drones and, and even micromobility. And really, again, we want to we want to build in an integrated system that understands how all of these things connect together. And so, if you're tweaking, you know, something on automated and, and connected vehicle applications, how's that going to impact all these other other things around here? So, you know. That's the real focus of what we're trying to do here uh, with our national labs. And again, we want to be able to uh, evaluate, you know, scenarios at very micro levels that, that could be of interest to various types of stakeholders. So maybe uh, industries interested in some aspects of, of, of things that we're looking at here, and maybe uh, transportation authorities are looking at different aspects of it. And we, we want to be able to tweak those um, for the different scenarios that, that, that the different people are, would be interested in looking at. Um, I briefly mentioned some of the core tools um, that we have. These are, again, our, I think of these as, as, the, as the toys, uh, the hardware, where, we, where what, we can, what, we're, what we can do is we can take the software and simulation that we're doing and you know, connect that to some of the hardware and look at um, some XIL type of capabilities. So if we change some of the hardware, how does that impact some of the software modeling that we're doing and vice versa. Um, and so, so there's some really, really interesting things that we've, we've been able to do here. Um, this slide in, in of itself would take a long time to, to explain. So I'm just gonna kind of move, move on, uh, just to give you some examples of some of the things that we can do once we're able to connect uh, these, the, the software to the hardware. Um, I mentioned another thing that we're able to do in terms of uh, 
applying our high performance, performing, high performance computing capabilities and our focus on artificial intelligence. And you know, we've got another suite of projects that are, and, and these here are focused just on the transportation system. We've got another set of projects looking at, you know, for example, uh, artificial intelligence to improve the perception um, for autonomous vehicles. Um, these are three new projects that we've, we've, um, we've, we've just funded um, at, 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 the, at the national labs, but including a variety of, of academic and um, even uh, industrial stakeholders. And importantly, each one of these projects has real world uh, transportation authorities to uh, where they can, where, 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 where what we're trying to do is connect the simulation uh, that we're doing and the, and the modeling and apply it and, and, to, real, and to, to really change decisions in real time and to really inform future developments of the things that we're doing. So uh, we're doing a lot of uh, different things uh, all the way from Honolulu uh, to Chattanooga. So really, really interesting, uh, really uh, a lot, long breadth of, of, of a lot, lot of different areas that we're, we're covering here. Um, we also have some some um, I mentioned also some of the solicitations that we have. Um, these are this is a snapshot of nine different projects we funded in the previous from, from last year's solicitation, um, doing everything from better understanding um, ride share pooling to freight optimization uh, and vehicle connectivity and then transit. So really connecting, doing a lot of work in a lot of different areas. We have an active uh, FOA right now, and uh, actually we're in the mid middle of evaluating the uh, proposals from this, so obviously can't talk much more about that other than you know, these are the topics that we had. And again, I think these are some topics that I think are relevant to the, to the, to the, uh, to the focus of this conference, um, you know, focusing more uh, very narrowly on a specific aspect of cooperative driving automation, um, and then the other topic that we have is implementing um, the modeling and simulation into real world applications. Um, you know, looking at, again, uh, improving uh, connectivity and automation at multiple levels of infrastructure and vehicle connectivity, but even improving transit, improving freight systems, and, and even things like transit as a service. But again, taking modeling and applying it to the real world. Um, that's really all I have. I, I just want to mention at, at, the, at the very moment that I'm giving this talk, our Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, is actually giving, uh, uh, introducing the fact that we're, we, we have two new solicitations and you can go to, I'll put it in the chat box, um, uh, that we have two new uh, solicitations on, on uh, focused on freight uh, and, and including a lot of the things that, that we're talking about here. Um, I'll stop here and leave yeah. um, room for, for the questions later on. Thank you, Prasad. I really appreciate it. Lots of good information. Um, let's move real quickly to Scott Michael Robertson. He's uh, from the, uh, the Senior Policy Advisor at the U.S. Department of Labor, Office of Disability Employment Policy, uh, and uh, supports employment related on the employment related supports team. Can you hear me okay? You, we could get a few minutes out of you and leave some time for Stan. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, if you could put your slide on full slide. Yeah, give me, give me one second. Um, can you see it okay? Yes. Great, okay. Um, and it's, it's great to be with you all. Uh, thank you for inviting me to present here on this federal panel. And actually it's been a long enough time that I should have emphasized to Lisa Kay that I actually had a promotion last fall actually the senior policy advisor. Uh, so my uh, presentation here is driving employment access to accessible automated vehicles. And I'm glad you all already stressed that already as one of the major priorities is the full trip access and full accessibility for people with disabilities. And um, our agency is, is small, the Office of Disability Employment Policy, US Department of Labor, but, but mighty. As uh, many have mentioned recently, we sort of punch above our weight, if you will, for our collaborations with uh, US Department of Transportation, uh, Department of Energy, um, Education, Health and Human Services, pretty much all other federal departments and agencies. We connect and collaborate and provide technical assistance, engage on shaping, informing, and enhancing policies and practices to increase access to employment for people with disabilities. 
So our mission at the Office of Disability Employment Policy, and we are marking our 20th year anniversary actually as an agency at the U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, we started in the beginning of the Bush administration. So our, our focus is on developing and influencing policies and practices that can increase the number and quality of employment opportunities for people with disabilities. So if you go to dol.gov slash agency slash ODEP, that's our website. You can learn more about what we're doing right now and what we've achieved in our 20 year history as an agency. And so I have a snapshot below on this slide of ODEP's website and the big logo for our 20th year anniversary at the bottom as well. And some of our initiatives include, this is just a few of them because it would hard, be hard to list them all on one slide, but some of them, uh, especially that are relevant are our partnership on employment and accessible technology and its future works initiative peteworks.org which is our technical assistance center on accessible technology and emerging technology for the future workplace um, our partnership on inclusive apprenticeship which is driving career pathways in high growth high demand fields like clean energy information technology um, financial services and, and systems um, professional consulting um, healthcare, pretty much all aspects of the economy, advanced manufacturing that are in, in a high growth state right now. So if you go to inclusiveapprenticeship.org, you can learn more about the Partnership on Inclusive Apprenticeship, or PIA for short, PIA, as well as the Job Accommodation Network, which provides workplace accommodations for free in terms of consult consulting on workplace accommodations for free, uh, expert confidential assistance on that um, at askjan.org and through the specialists at, at the Job Accommodation Network. And EARN, which is our technical assistance network, um, uh, provides technical assistance um, uh, through that TA center for um, employers to um, increase access to um, and, and foster uh, re recruitment, hiring, um, ma um, maintaining and uh, advancing um, career pathways for workers with disabilities. And that's askjan.org. And the logos on this slide are for, again, uh, peteworks.org, uh, Pete, um, AskJan.org and AskEarn.org, Pete, Jan, and, and Earn. We don't have a logo for uh, PIA, unfortunately, because the other initiatives are grandfathered in, and we couldn't get one recently for that. So it just has a um, its tag name. The Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology, or P, uh, promotes a lot of facets around emerging technology, which, which was already mentioned, like artificial intelligence, virtual and augmented reality, et cetera. And which is especially relevant to y'all is we've been doing a lot of collaboration engagement work on accessible um, mobility technology, including automated vehicles, autonomous vehicles, because it would, it would produce so much impact on increasing access to work transportation for people with disabilities. And that includes people with sensory, cognitive, and physical disabilities who experience pervasive transportation barriers to access work opportunities that match skills and talents of job seekers and workers. And that especially has um, implications for suburban, rural, and small town areas, um, which often, even more so than urban areas, have more limited access to reliable, accessible, affordable public transportation systems. And so DOT's survey from the Bureau of Transportation Statistics from 2018 found that um, this is um, their um, survey on travelers uh, with disabilities found that at least 25.5 million Americans have experienced travel limiting disabilities. And again, that includes from disability areas across the board. Um, I myself, for instance, um, don't drive. I'm an autistic adult and have other cognitive disabilities. And that's true for uh, most autistic uh, people. Uh, either do not have a driver's license or experience some significant challenges to driving um, and accessing transportation systems. And for instance, folks with sensory disabilities, folks who are blind, low vision, um, very significant portion of folks. So we believe in the promises of accessible auto automated vehicles and other mobility technology to enhance transportation and work. But that means integration uh, best practices like universal design principles, accessible technologies, and engaging in collaboration to support full access to the, the full trip um, all aspects of mobility to be considered on what it means for full accessibility for people with disabilities, to make sure that folks can get access to the workplace, uh, community living, schools, healthcare services, et cetera. And PeteWorks.org has a web page on accessible automated vehicles, podcasts, other resources, information you can learn about accessibility for um, mobility, um, especially automated vehicles. Um, if you go afterwards, I can make sure the slides can become available. Um, if you click on the link on this slide, you'll be able to see this snapshot of page that I have at the bottom uh, that shows the uh, our AV page at peteworks.org. 
And lastly, I want to also highlight that the U.S. Access Board right now, which is the independent federal agency that focuses on uh, spearheading support for accessibility um, and guidelines and standards for accessibility for people with disabilities in infrastructure um, across the country, has been hosting national online dialogues on accessible automated vehicles here in 2021 in collaboration with ODEP. So uh, these national online dialogues, which you can find the links again from this slide, are on focuses like entering and exiting vehicles, maneuvering and securement for vehicles. And this is all, especially from the physical disability end of things. And then accessibility for passengers with cognitive or sensory disabilities and how we can be supporting accessible design of automated uh, vehicles. So these online dialogues are online, right? You know, they're going on right now. Uh, you can participate by going to the links later on from these slides. And what complements also what we're learning about ideas and information on here. And I should say with these online dialogues, they're not, you know, comments for regulation or rulemaking. These are ideas for how we're shaping policies and practices. So we're looking for innovative ideas in this space of accessibility in automated vehicles and other mobility technology. And we also have had, uh, um, the Access Board has also been hosting webinars to complement these national online dialogues. Um, and you can download the slides that have been recorded uh, for these sessions from um, Access um, dashboard.gov slash AV. And the first three of these sessions, again, that were previously recorded were on mobility disabilities. And the first part of the session on sensory and cognitive disabilities. And again, if you go online, you can get access to YouTube. I believe they're on YouTube sessions. And the, the, the second part of the session on sensory and cognitive disabilities is, is airing on April 21st. And I have some pictures on the bottom of this slide that I wanted to briefly mention. Uh, the universal symbol for accessibility for people with disabilities is a uh, wheelchair user in, in, in active mobility engagement, um, moving the wheelchair forward, as well as some pictures here of how that would be applied in terms of this context of automated vehicles, some, um, a, an automated vehicle and an automated um, bus and then on the right hand side here is a picture of um, a, what, uh, a, um, uh, for um, a blind user and then also the universal symbol for neurodiversity, which is a major facet of cognitive accessibility. Um, and just as a slight mention for that, it's uh, National Autism Month right now, which cross connects a lot to the work we also do on uh, neurodiversity at work and national autism policy in collaboration with our federal partners. And my contact information is, is robertson.scott.m at dol.gov. So feel free to email me. And it's you know great connecting with y'all. And we love, uh, especially enjoy these conversations with our federal sister agencies um, here across the federal government, increasing access to mobility for all people, including um, people with disabilities. And the reference here is to that um, Metro I, the BTS statistics is here at the end of this slide deck. Thank you so much, Scott. And I, I hope everyone, uh, notes that in the uh, administration's bill, it's very deliberate about uh, bike, walk, and roll. Uh, next speaker is Stan Young, uh, who uh, is an advanced transportation and urban scientist uh, and the mobility systems team lead at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And Stan, if you can uh, take us to 12.05 and we'll just take a couple minutes. And so if anyone in, just a couple minutes into the break. If anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat pod uh, so we can get to a couple of those, or at least folks can see the questions. And note that all these people will be staying a while and uh, helping out in the breakouts, I hope, and you'll have a chance to interact with them. Stan. Thank you, Sherry, and thanks, uh, Scott, for that, that background. I always enjoy hearing you speak. Uh, I have a few short slides to, to share a project that kind of exemplifies cross cross-domain interaction. Uh, of course, it's, it's related to energy because I'm with the National Renewable Energy Lab and it's integrating into uh, mainstream transportation. We call it the Transportation Energy Analytics Dashboard. Uh, luckily, this got delayed a year. If I gave this a year ago, it'd be in process, uh, but now it is out and functional. So I was gonna show you a couple snapshots and share the objectives with that. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge funding by the Department of Energy Vehicle Technologies Office, specifically the technology integration area. Now, if I can advance slides, there we go. 
Um, the TEED, as we call it, uh, was sponsored by the USDOT, but it was uh, an effort. Uh, I was formerly with the University of Maryland Center for Advanced Transportation Technology, CAT Center, and my good friend back there, Michael Pack, of course, uh, creates pretty good analytics. Uh, uh, he calls the system the, the Regional Integrated Transportation Information System, or RITIS for short. Many of you may be familiar with it, but this is a, a a traditional uh, and we would argue leading, very uh, very leading edge transportation and mobility analytics platform, particularly for travel time, uh, for travel time reliability, for congestion. And, and we got together and I said, Michael, you're missing energy, you're missing emissions. So we got together and put together this concepts to merge um, appropriately the, the energy aspect into it, into his, his already uh, very sharp, very leading edge uh, mobility. Uh, analytics platform. We had several partners, of course, CAT and CAT Lab. Uh, Maryland Transportation Institute and NREL came in with the energy uh, aspect. We've had several projects previously to help characterize energy. And we had two outstanding uh, stakeholder partners, uh, one with a Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments uh, and the other one with, with Columbus, Ohio, particularly through the MPO there, Mid-Ohio uh, plant. Uh, MORPC, well, you figure out the acronym uh, pretty quick there, Mid-Ohio Planning Council or something like that. Um, I always love live webinars, you get to stumble. So the, the TEED framework, I like this visualization. It, it's more busy than I wanna go through, but, but on the left-hand side, there are a lot of data sources. Our two primary data sources were vehicle probe data from industry uh, upon which a lot of RITIS is already based and vehicle registrations. Uh, this is something that each state has. They're not always easy to get to, but we were able to bring those two in. We also got jurisdictional data and, and in future iterations, we hope to integrate weather. Uh, the, the grid mixture, if you buy an EV, you gotta know what the grid is. Uh, and vehicle trajectory data. This is highly granular, uh, one step further than vehicle probe data. You actually get to see the thing move in real time. But anyway, those are the data inputs. Of course, we use RITIS as the platform and extended it, extended it with uh, the expertise and tools that NREL and Maryland Transportation Institute brought to the table. And we came up with several <laughs> core dashboards that reflect greenhouse gas, energy, and even traditional emissions, uh, PM 2.5 and things like that. And we do have five core dashboards. I was going to show you a sampling of three of them. Uh, these core dashboards are built on what we traditionally expect to see through a congestion or travel time point of view, but then cast from an energy or emissions point of view. Uh, the first one is this. Uh, you may recognize immediately the footprint of Washington, D.C. here. Uh, this is for the, the, the greater Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. And this, this is a map that you traditionally see either with speeds on segments or something like that reflecting congestion. Now it reflects instead of speed, the energy intensity. We can change the color coding for uh, energy intensity, uh, energy intensity per VMT, uh, NOx, PM 2.5, slice it and dice it any way you want. Uh, but the idea is here's the, the, the dimension to, to begin to complement uh, both the mobility aspects as well. Uh, in another couple of our dashboards, the one on the left, if you're familiar with uh, user user cost and either travel time or, or monetary, you'll used to charts like this. Uh, on the vertical slices are times of day from midnight to midnight, and on the horizontal slices, in this case, is day to day, Sunday through Friday. And you can read these. These are just color-coded intensity plots, but instead of seeing uh, travel time or congestion cost, you're actually seeing um, total energy usage in BTUs. So just another way to do it. And then you can change the display metric any way you want and slice and dice the time any way you want as well. Um, those first two are ones that, that, you know, they have very traditional counterparts in travel time and congestion. The one on the right is somewhat new, uh, particularly as we transition the, the fleet over to new fuels is taking a look at an area and taking a look at the distribution of hybrids, EVs, ICEs, and in this case, diesel. And this is representative because if those were real numbers, you're probably EVs and hybrids would be indiscernible from the ICEs and diesels. Uh, but we have that information in there. We were able to get it for the two cities. And you can not only do the two cities as a whole, but sub-select a certain area, a neighborhood, a region, or something like that within the metropolitan area. Uh, this is very helpful as cities are setting uh, goals um, to, to get to full electrification. 
Uh, I wanted to somewhat end this on how did this all come together, uh, kind of the lineage of it all. After I put this chart together, I realized it reads more from, from right to left than the left to right. I mean, we got to the energy analytics dashboard through the collaboration of three major institutes there in the middle. I've already gone over that. But really, it built on a lot of partners and tools that spans many domains. I, I mentioned the partners and tools of, of Columbus, uh, Metro DC, the Eastern Transportation Coalition, that's a huge partner with Aridis. Uh, the Incentrip was, was a product that MTI put together coming out of an RPE Transnet, as well as NREL has several tools down there, Fast Sim and Route E, all developed um, and all of these, you know, brought forward by previous funding sources, whether they're state or local, USDOT, the Smart Cities Challenge, of course, with Columbus. I mentioned RPE and Transnet, uh, MCOMP grants from about a decade ago we're building on, as well as uh, the DOE, EAMS, SMART, and TI that, that Prasad uh, uh, shared. Um, so kind of summing all this up, um, I, I actually had to change this to present tense, this first one. The old slide was future tense. Energy emissions and greenhouse gases have become as much a part of transportation planning as safety congestion and travel time. Um, this was seen in the latest build grant. Uh, I was expecting to see that when it came out. I was still somewhat surprised, but glad to see it there. Uh, TEED is a step towards providing a tool towards that to deal with use cases. I mean, we're comparing things that are, are, you know, how do you compare a BRT line with on-demand electrified transit in an appropriate context to begin things? So policy, teleworking, uh, the, the incredible virtual presence, what we're having now, is this going to be long lasting or just transitory and what will the impacts be? Um, we do a lot with employer provided mobility. My ears keep perking up every time I hear about the relationship uh, disparity between housing and jobs and how can we reflect some of that. Uh, probably the fourth one down is the most, uh, most, you know, where we're at today, what can this tool help with, what will be the impact of a 50% EV consumer fleet by 2030, we can do that. Uh, we're also a lot of talk about freight and freight signal priorities. So that's where we hope to do it. And my last slide is playing this forward. Now this reads left to right. Uh, we're in T1 in those five tools and T2, we hope to really get, you know, drill down and, and get a really full, uh, system out there. Uh, uh, that includes the whole idea of delay being excessive travel time. We got to get to an idea of excessive energy use over base energy use, and we hope to capture that. Uh, what's the energy in signals through ATSPMs and the energy in, in ATMS treatments? Uh, several upgrades are outlined. We hope to, to have future development partners beyond the core that we started with. Uh, a shout out to NIST, who's shown interest in the overall hey, once we have the transportation emissions and energy, maybe we can do better holistic modeling at the city and atmospheric level. Uh, we've had both industry and additional academic partners that have shown interest in moving forward. Possible funding, it's all great out there, nothing great there. Uh, we continue to look for ways to, to move this forward from a number of different vantage points, but trying to provide useful tools. Thank you for your time. I hope that's somewhat instructive of, of how we're the, the whole area of mobility and transportation are merging from several domains and, and we're having a lot of fun trying to bring tools to the table to help address that. Thank you very much, Stan. And I uh, wanna thank all of the presenters, uh, David, Prasad, Scott, uh, and Stan. And I, I hope this has been useful for folks. The point was to kind of give you a smorgasbord of the activities underway uh, from where we sit with this periphery view of looking at all the federal research, looking at all the UTC research, you sit there and say, oh, I want these people to talk to each other and there'll be some great synergies that might take place. So I hope everybody's gotten something out of this and uh, can dive into the slides as they're made available as well. We thank you for being the moderator of this very informative panel. And uh, a lot of thanks go to the panelists, of course, uh, David, Prasad, uh, Stan and Scott. Uh,